Reincarnation is a topic we sometimes bring up in conversation, and many people are skeptical of the idea. For years, various researchers have sought and continue to seek the truth. The ancient Egyptians, Romans, and Greeks all believed in reincarnation of the human soul. The idea of reincarnation is even a basic rule in Hinduism, the third largest religion in the world. Today, millions of people believe in reincarnation, or at least accept the possibility that it may exist. Reincarnation is also based on the idea that after physical death, the human soul stays in the astral, after which it is reincarnated on Earth, being of another gender, in another country, and having different interests than those in its previous life. In this video, we will tell you about an even stranger reincarnation. An ancient priestess from the cult of Isis is reincarnated in the body of three-year-old Dorothy Edie. Edie ceases to exist, and the ancient Bintrashit begins to find her way home, pinpoints the location of decades undiscovered ancient sites, knows details that have never been published, and is responsible for some of the greatest archaeological discoveries in Egypt. How does it all begin? Born in London in 1904 to parents of Irish descent, Dorothy Eady's remarkable story began at the age of three. Then, while playing, she falls headfirst down the winding staircase in her home and falls unconscious. When the family doctor arrives, he says there is nothing he can do. He simply states the sad fact that the infant girl has died. They place the child in the cot in his room, and the doctor, leaving the house, declares that he will return to take care of the body. The doctor returned after an hour with the death certificate and carefully began to discuss with the parents what was to come. During the conversation, a rustling sound was heard from Dorothy's room. They ran upstairs, and there she was playing as if nothing had happened. The doctor examined her again. There were no signs of injury. He had no explanation. He told the parents that Dorothy seemed to have risen from the dead. As he spoke these words, the doctor hardly realized how right he was. The narratives diverge here. Some claim that she was declared dead, then suddenly revived. Others claim that she was simply unconscious and suffered some sort of rare brain damage. But there are no two opinions about what follows after that. Whatever the case, it changes her forever. On the one hand, her speech has noticeably changed. On the other hand, she kept asking her parents to take her home. When they asked her where her home was, the girl couldn't say. Her mother and father were understandably baffled. Sometime in the first year after the accident, Dorothy's parents took her to an Egyptian exhibit at the British Museum. If her story hasn't seemed strange to you up to this point, then what follows is bound to disturb you. As Dorothy walked among the artifacts, she suddenly pointed to a picture and exclaimed, There's my home! On the image was the temple of Seti I, a late 13th century BC pharaoh who was the father of Ramses the Great. The child insisted fervently that it had once lived in the same building and then noticed that something was missing. Where are the trees? Where are the gardens? It asked. Seeing a photograph of the well-preserved mummy of Seti I, she claimed to have known him personally. Dorothy happily ran around the Egyptian rooms in the museum, kissing the feet of the statues and saying, these are my people, not wanting to leave. When she grew up, the girl began to visit the expositions as often as she could. At one point, she attracted the attention of the famous Egyptologist E. A. Wallace Budge, who encouraged her to study hieroglyphics. Dorothy says that she knows the hieroglyphic script, but has forgotten how to read it. At the age of 14, one night she experienced a vision of Seti I seeing a man in hell who had suddenly found a way out. She also has a recurring dream in which she and other women and girls are lying on mats in a huge room, and an old man with a lamp checks that they are in their places. In her dreams, she sees a huge building with columns and a garden full of fruits and flowers. Dorothy's obsession with ancient Egypt deepens as she grows up. One of the Sunday school teachers even asked her parents to keep her home because of her tendency to compare Christianity with Egyptian paganism. She also begins to describe her intimate relationship with Seti I. She claims to have been his lover in a previous life and even describes visions of nocturnal visits where he comes to her bedside. Dorothy's parents sent her to various sanatoriums, but nothing helped. She did not give up her convictions, 
At the age of 16, she left school for good. The interesting thing is that, in fact, her education had only just begun, enrolled to study part-time at Plymouth School of Art. During this period, Dorothy deals with the details of her previous life. She tells her parents that nocturnal apparitions of the god hor -Ra have been dictating details of her past life for a year now. She was born into the family of a soldier and a vegetable seller, who named her Bentrishite, which meant Harp of Joy. At the age of three, after the death of her mother, she was abandoned and raised in the temple of Seti I at Abydos, the same building that Adi points to as a four-year-old. At the age of 14, she met the pharaoh in the temple gardens while serving as a priestess of Isis. They had a brief affair. For the priestess of Isis, however, losing one's virginity was a capital crime. After becoming pregnant with Seti's child, Bentrashite was brought to trial. She was questioned by the high priest and beaten when she refuses to answer, a scene that often appears in her dreams beforehand. She eventually admits that her lover was the king and kills herself to spare him the humiliation. She remained in love with him until her last breath and was happy when his spirit joined hers between lives. Moving to Egypt The next milestone for Dorothy came when she was 27 years old. Then she started writing for an Egyptian magazine in London. There she met Imam Abdel Magid, whom she married. They settled in Cairo and gave birth to a son. She called him Seti after her long-lost beloved Pharaoh, and she herself takes the nickname Om Seti, which means Seti's mother in Arabic. Things are not going well for her in Cairo. She marries into a family that does not accept her descriptions of Pharaonic ghosts and out-of-body experiences. The marriage eventually failed, lasting only two years before Imam left her and moved to Iraq. Om Seti remained in Cairo raising her son and working as a draftsman at the National Department of Antiquities. During her time there, she published numerous books and articles that still enjoy great approval and popularity. Many of the locals feared her because she spent whole nights alone in the Great Pyramid of Giza or laid offerings at the feet of the Sphinx. These rituals scared people. In a strange contradiction, on the other hand, she was admirable for being so committed to her beliefs. Work in Abydos in her 50s, Om Seti suddenly got an opportunity to work alongside the archaeologists at Abydos. Naturally, she accepts the offer without a second thought. After all, Abydos is where Seti I and Bintrashite became lovers, the same place she had pointed out as a four-year-old girl in the British Museum. In 1956, she became the first woman to work in the Antiquities Department at Abydos and took up residence in the temple itself. There, she proved to be of invaluable help to the researchers. Among other achievements, she helped them discover the ruins of the gardens she had described so long ago. Omseti pointed out the exact plot of land. After careful excavations, this has been irrefutably confirmed. The unexplored site once contained a garden, with its precise memories of the types of trees and their arrangement. She also led archaeologists to a tunnel north of the temple that had gone unnoticed for decades. According to Om Seti, her advice is the fruit of her memories from the time she lived there. Even more incredible was the test she was subjected to by the Director General of the Egyptian Antiquities Department. He took her to Seti's temple and verified her claims. Standing there in complete darkness, he described a series of murals to her. After each description, the Director asked her to go in the direction of a specific mural. She did it without making a single mistake. The director was naturally amazed. The location of these murals has never been published or publicized. Spending the rest of her days in Abydos, Om Seti provided invaluable assistance to researchers and archaeologists. Above all, however, she chose to stay there because, according to her, the place brought her a sense of peace. She believed that this was how she was atoning for Bintrashite's sins. Being able to work with the researchers was just a bonus. I had only one goal in life, says A.D., and that was to go to Abydos, live in Abydos, and be buried in Abydos. Her contribution to Egyptology is undeniable. She possessed an unprecedented understanding of the hieroglyphic script and was very familiar with the local ruins. In 1981, the year of her death, she even appeared in a National Geographic documentary titled Egypt in Search of Eternity. Death and Burial 
Om said he died at the age of 77. Knowing that no Christian or Muslim cemetery would accept her, she began to build her own tomb in her garden during her lifetime. Naturally, she wanted to have an underground chamber with a concrete slab. At the last moment, however, the health authorities intervened and insisted that she be buried in a proper manner. The local Coptic cemetery finally relented and granted her an unwanted plot in the dry desert. The condition was that no sign should be placed over her grave. She had to settle for just a pile of stones. Her anonymous burial marked an unceremonious end to an extraordinary life. Even today, over 40 years later, attempts to disprove her claims continue. Detractors suspect Om Seti somehow got access to unpublished material and used it to mislead people. As tempting as it is to dismiss her as just another attention-seeking charlatan, perhaps we should remember what Shakespeare has Hamlet say to Horatio. There are more things in heaven and earth than were dreamed of in your philosophy. Dorothy Eady's life is a remarkable story on many levels. Even if everything up to this point has not made you believe in reincarnation, this is a true story that highlights the power of faith, determination, and the courage to follow your dreams. Dorothy Eady's belief in reincarnation and her commitment to the study of the ancient Egyptians made her a legendary figure in the world of ancient Egyptian studies. Her work had a lasting impact on the field, and her legacy lives on in the many books and articles she wrote on the subject. Dorothy Eady's story is a reminder of the power of following your heart and believing in what everyone else tells you is impossible. Share your thoughts on the topic in a comment. Support us by subscribing to the channel and sharing this video.